Good day, everyone. Welcome to Education 502, Methods of Research, and Education 505, Research Seminar and Practical. Today, I'll be discussing about one of the most important topics in research writing, particularly in writing a thesis proposal, that is problem formulation and gap spotting. Actually, they are one and the same. Some scholars use the word problem formulation, other scholars use the word gap spotting. Um, they serve the same purpose. You know, they develop the gap or the problem that the researcher wants to see addressed in his or her research. So um, there are three major topics here um, that I will discuss in this video lecture. Uh, first is why the need for problem formulation and or gap spotting. So I will explain very briefly why we need to do this. Um, why we need to, or researchers need to clearly articulate the problem that they want to address in the proposed research or the gap that they need to, or they want to fill in. And then the second um, major topic that I wish to talk about in this video lecture is the two major ways to formulate a research problem or in identifying a research gap. Um, the first one, as I will show later, the first one is through observing what's going on around, through observing concrete social realities and and, and out of what the researcher or out of what you have observed in the workplace or in your community or whatever, you develop a problem that you want to investigate, that you want to study. That's the first um, way or means. The other is the famous uh, literature review. So we go to the library and then read literature about the topic that you have chosen or about a particular research interest and see and look for you know gaps in those literature that those scholars that you have reviewed have missed or failed to address. So I will talk very briefly on this as well. And uh, but I will focus on on the first way that is observing concrete social realities and develop a problem out of that. Um, the second means, which is um, identifying a research gap or developing a research problem using a literature review, will be addressed in my second um, video lecture. And the third part, or the third major topic that I will talk about in this video lecture is the four samples of a one-page research problem that I will show later. And I will explain each uh, sample and teach you some techniques on how to come up with a researchable problem you know, uh, using you know, uh, observation of concrete social realities or observation of what's going on, what's happening in the community or in the workplace, okay? So uh, let me begin with the first point, why the need to um, do problem formulation or gap spotting at the start of a um, of, uh, few research uh, activity. Um, I have a note here. I said, all types of research begin with problem formulation or gap spotting. Okay, so we have to remember that in this course, um, research method and, and education 505 research seminar and practical. For the for, for edu, uh, education 502 students, you are required to submit a one page research gap or research problem at the end of the semester. That's your final requirements. For education 505 students, um, research seminar and method, the final requirement is uh, a concept paper. And a concept paper is like a mini thesis proposal where you develop very briefly um, the background and rationale of your proposed study. And then you write very briefly your literature review just to show that there is indeed a need to conduct that research. And then uh, 
and then and then construct or develop very briefly as well your methodology and other stuff. Um, I, I will discuss in my future video lectures how to prepare a concept paper. What I'm trying to say here is, since you're going to prepare a concept paper and later on a thesis proposal, the entire process of writing that piece of paper, that thesis proposal, begins with problem formulation. As I will show later, there is no research without a research problem, okay? So if, if the entire process of writing your thesis proposal or your research as a whole um, begins with identifying a research problem and ends with the recommendation, you know, the last part of your, that last part of your research that aims to address the problem that you have identified from the very beginning. So that's the entire, you know, an overview of the entire process of writing your thesis proposal. Then it is proper that we begin our discussion at this point in the semester on problem formulation or gap spotting. So that's the rationale behind, you know, this video lecture or this part of the syllabus that is problem formulation or gap spotting. And so as I already intimated above, I just, as I just uh, uh, mentioned uh, a while ago, this is because there is no research activity without a research problem or a research gap. I have explained that already. And so, and then as you already know, the research activity per se is a response to the problem or a gap. So please take note that researchers, especially established researchers, they do not conduct research simply because they want to do research. They do not conduct research because they're forced to do research. They do not conduct research simply because they want to get promoted. Well, maybe that's part of the package deal, but the main purpose of doing a research is to address a particular problem. Okay, so, so for example, you have observed a serious problem in the workplace, like for example, issues about burnout in the workplace, or you have observed a serious, a serious issue in your community, like for example, um, people in the in your in your community in your place is not resilient or is not ready for disaster and calamities and things like that. So you can conduct research in that. Okay. So and so researchers study a particular phenomenon or conduct research, investigates a particular phenomenon because they are responding to something, and that something is in the first place the problem. Okay, the gap. And, and I hope that you um, inculcate this in your mind. I hope you always remember this as masters or doctoral students, that the thesis at the end of your course is not just a requirement for you to get the degree. Of course, everybody wants to have the degree, to complete the degree, but look uh, in the graduate school, especially, you know, uh, in thesis writing, we are training you to become researchers because as we already discussed in the introductory part of this course, the start of the semester, uh, research is very important in the society, okay? Some of the novel and innovative problems, you know, or, or solutions to a particular problems are products of research. And so think, for example, of of the vaccines you know, that we have um, now available nowadays. And so these vaccines were produced by scientists researchers because there is a huge problem that threatens us and that's the COVID-19. So, so again, um, the scientists <laughs> do not just do research or conduct research because you know, they want to do it. There is again and again and again a problem that they want to see addressed. And so, just to reiterate, this is exactly the reason why we, we start, we begin um, the discussion of research proposal writing with problem formulation. Okay. 
even in experimental research, scientists like pharmacists and chemists conduct research aimed at developing a particular medicine as a way of addressing problems like dengue or malaria. Okay, so I'll explain that to Ray. So they respond to something, respond to a serious threat, respond to a problem. And so therefore, again, there is, um, they conduct research. And so instead of the famous title defense, we need to do problem formulation or gap spotting. I want to dwell a bit on this because uh, title defense is very famous in, in the Philippine setting. You know, uh, many research professors or research teachers in the undergrad or senior high school, I have known many of them, um, um, had title defense in their class or in the research class. My argument is that um, I think it's about, it, it's time that we abandon that technique because there is a huge possibility that in title defense, the researcher or maybe the professor or the advisor missed to you know, address the, the key concepts or the variables or the main problems that they want to see addressed in their, in their research paper, okay? So, um, because the practice of coming up with a title defense is, look, um, again, a, a research professor may require students to submit three working titles or possible titles or five possible titles. And then they, they choose uh, one title based on maybe aesthetic or a title that, uh, that is eye-catching. But most of the time, the problem is uh, this style of coming up with a working title or coming up with a problem needs to, to clearly you know, identify um, uh, the problem that, um, again, um, the researcher would like to address in the research. So, and so the title will happen actually, that, that uh, will happen later. Huh? Um, um, at the end of the day, uh, the, the title of the research will be developed later. So what we will have is a working title, but we can come up with a working title, as I will show in the four samples that I will discuss later on. Uh, the working title will be the last um, 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 parts of the of the one page research gap that you will uh, develop. Okay, so um, instead again of uh, title defense, professors, research teachers, or professors. I should say, and this is my argument, so you may not agree with me, but my argument is that we focus more on problem formulation and gap spotting because, again, it is the research problem or the research gap that, that, that will set the sail of your research journey. I now move to the two major ways or major techniques in formulating research problem or in identifying a research gap. The first one, as I already mentioned, is through observation of concrete social realities. Here, um, we don't resort to books or articles, or journal articles, or any written resources. Uh, we just observe what's going on around. We just observe the nature and dynamics of a particular phenomenon. Or you observe, or uh, you observe what's happening in the workplace. I mentioned already uh, a while ago, in the workplace in in your community, and out of the issues and problems that you have identified, like what I mentioned a while ago, um, people in the community are not disaster ready, or they are not equipped with the necessary skills and knowledge in combating or in, in facing a natural disaster. And so you can conduct research on disaster preparedness among the coastal people of, of Lady Gulf, something like that. And then the second uh, way is the famous literature review. So this is, this is actually um, uh, the most common one because um, every time we do research, even when I was in the undergrad, you know, uh, when we were asked to, 
to when when when, when I enrolled in thesis writing, we were asked by our professor, research professor, to go to the library and conduct literature review and then come up with a research cover a research problem. Uh, yes, there's nothing wrong with this, of course. Um, normally, what we need to do is when we conduct research and when we identify the problem or the gap of our research is, of course, you choose a particular research interest and then identify a possible topic and then you go to the library and then read uh, literature, related literature on the topic and, and see what these scholars, these authors of this related literature say about that particular topic that you have chosen and then identify or um, well, I, I identify some gaps in that literature that in, in that topic that these scholars miss to address. And that's where you situate the originality, originality of your research. And that's how you identify a research gap that you will feel in, in your research proposal. So, um, again, that's the second method, the second way uh, to, to formulate a research problem. Um, as I mentioned already, um, I will discuss this video lecture will focus only on, on the first way, that is through observation of concrete social realities. Okay? The next video lecture will talk about um, identifying a research gap through literature review. I'll do that later. Okay, so I may now proceed to the the um, the third major part of this video lecture, and that is a concrete samples or a concrete instantiation of a one-page research problem of the way in which a researcher articulates the, the gap or the problem of a proposed research. So there are four um, uh, samples here. I will briefly discuss each and again uh, show you, teach you how um, to develop a problem or a research problem outside mere observation of concrete social realities. Okay, so let me proceed to this. Um, look. So again, there are four samples as I show here. Look, this one, uh, the first sample is, and the working title is Knowledge and Attitude Among Sugarcane Farmers in Negros Island Toward Climate Change. And then the um, next sample is uh, Sports as Drug Abuse Prevention. And then we have the third one is factors affecting the SBM level of practice in the division of Delira. And then lastly, we have policy challenges in responses in the time of pandemic, the case of Banco Central and Filipinas. So let me go back to the first one, knowledge and attitude of knowledge and attitude of sugarcane, knowledge and attitude among sugarcane farmers in Negros Island to climate change. So for Education 502 students, this is what you will submit at the end of the semester. This is your final requirement, okay? Because as uh, I think um, um, Education 502 or Methods of Research is offered to first year um, research students in the master's program. And the next semester you might, you may enroll in Education 505, which is research seminar and practical. And so since this video lecture is for the both of those courses, edu or education, education 502 and Education 505, um, um, I will highlight, you know, the first year of uh, master's students that again, um, the final requirement is or in, in, in that course is this one page research problem or research gap. And please take note that um, it may look uh, very simple, but this is the most difficult part in any research activity. Problem formulation or gap spotting is the most difficult parts and many scholars will agree with me in conducting research. In fact, we have the cliche 
in research, which goes once you have identified the problem of your proposed research, then the research is halfway done. Because look, once you have the problem, a clear problem or a clear research problem, then you have set the sail of your research journey. You know exactly what to do next. You know exactly how to write and what to write in your background of the study. You know exactly what literature you know, to look for in the library or in the internet. So you know how to develop the methodology and things like that, okay? So yeah, yeah. so this is for, for the, um, Education 502 students. For Education 505 research seminar and practicum, again, your final requirement is a concept paper. However, again, as I mentioned many times already, you cannot begin writing your concept paper or your thesis proposal if you do not have this. Not necessarily a one-page research gap, but if you do not have a research gap or a problem that you will address in your proposed research. So again, um, for ed Education 505 students, you begin with this as well. So uh, let me discuss this part. So the working title of the first sample is, again, knowledge and attitude among sugarcane farmers in Negros Island toward climate change. Now, when I develop this uh, one-page research problem, the last column, no, the last row that I will fill in in this uh, uh, template is the working title. So that's what I uh, I said a while ago that that um, the working title will be framed, will be formulated later, and so I will begin with the research gap or the research problem, the second row, and then proceed to the research goal, and then thesis statements, and then methodology, and then once uh, we have identified the research problem, and then you have the research goal, and then you have your argument as to why the need to conduct this research, a thesis statements, and you have an initial idea of what methods to, what methods to employ, in, especially in gathering the data, of your research, then we go back to the first row, and that's the working then that's the working title, and, and, and that's where you formulate the working title. So let me begin with uh, the research problem. Um, I said I wrote here: the researcher observes that sugarcane farmers in Negros Island continue to perform the antiquated practice of burning residual sugarcane leaves after harvest. This practice is done in the face of Ecological Solid Waste Management, or Management Acts or RA 9003 and Clean Air Acts or RA 8749 that prohibit and penalize open burning of waste, which is defined as the thermal destruction of waste by means of direct exposure to fire. As we can see, if this practice is left unchecked, then it will not only cause air pollution, but also damage our ozone layer, which in turn will contribute to climate change. So look, in this research problem, I do not go to the library. I, do not, I did not go to the library. I did not read uh, literature in, in, in the internet. I was able to come up with the research problem, with this research problem, with this research gap, because I have observed something in the community. Just to provide you the context, um, before I moved to Eastern Visaya State University, as I um, <laughs> um, mentioned in the, in, during the orientation of this course, uh, I, I, taught, I, I taught for, uh, uh, for 16 years in Siliman University in Domagete city. And Domagete is the capital of Negros Oriental. And once in a while, uh, we drove to, from Domagete city to Bacolod city. And the idea here is when you are driving from Domagete, if, if you roam around um, um, uh, Negros Island, you all, what, what you always see are thousands of hectares of sugarcane sugar cane plantations. Okay, so I've been traveling from Dumaguete to Tobacolod for many years, many times already. And along the way, I observe how 
the sugarcane farmers do things because as a researcher, we need to be a keen observer. And so, and so I had observed many times in the past that the sugarcane farmers in Negros Island continue to burn, you know, the, the residual uh, sugarcane leaves after harvest. And then I learned about the law that prohibit that practice. And, and I learned that the law has been implemented, RA 9003 and RA 8749 have been already implemented for years already. And yet these farmers continue to burn the sugarcane leaves after harvest. And so as a researcher, you can think of, you know, in terms of climate change, there is air pollution. And so these people, this practice contribute to climate change. And it will, as I mentioned here, it will cause air pollution. It will damage the ozone layer. But also at the same time, I can think as well of policy issues because maybe look, um, these farmers, because these huge tracts of sugar cane, sugarcane sugar plantations are owned by are owned by rich people, by hacienderos. And sometimes uh, the owners of these uh, sugarcane plantations, these thousands of hectares of sugarcane plantations are also at the same time government officials, mayors, councillors, sometimes a congressman or, or a governor. And so even if even if they these farmers know that the the the, the the, the practice of burning residual sugarcane leaves after harvest is illegal, is already illegal, but they continue to do that because they were forced to do so because that's the instruction of, of, of the owner. Because you have to think that if these hacienderos, if these sugarcane plantations will follow the policy, then it entails uh, um, 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 a relatively big expenses on their parts. Because if they're going to dispose these leaves, this residual sugarcane leaves after harvest <coughs> properly, then they have to spend enough for that. And so suppose um, uh, a sugarcane planter or the Ascendero um, earns 1 million pesos per hectare net. And if, if he or she or the owner uh, strictly follows the policy that he or she has to, to dispose the, the waste properly, then maybe the owner will spend 200,000 for proper waste disposal. So instead of earning uh, 1 million net for one hectare, they lose 2,000. And so instead of, instead of following the policy, they just continue to do it. And there is an issue, of, there's a policy issue there because, because look, there is no proper, uh, 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 the policy RA9003 and, and 8749 were not properly implemented. So you see, on the other hand, if uh, these farmers do not really know about the policy, if the owners of the plantations do not, the sugarcane plantations do not really know the policy. And then as researchers, we can recommend some training orientation or any com information campaign so that these farmers and the owners will follow the policy. But we cannot do that. We cannot offer the recommendations if we do not do research on the topic. So we do not, so the point is, we do not know yet whether these farmers are doing the practice, uh, burning the residual sugarcane leaves after harvest, um, whether, whether they know the policy or not, if we do not conduct research. And so as researchers, we may conduct a case study on this, 
or we may talk about uh, or we may employ a narrative case study and go to the, to, the, to the community, to the field, interview these people and gather some data that will inform you as researchers in developing your policy so that you will be able to address the problem of again, air pollution, uh, ozone layer, damage of ozone layer, and then climate change, and maybe you can add policy issues, okay? So out of that observation, I as a, I, as a researcher was able, I was able to develop a research problem. And so therefore this is, given the magnitude of the problem, this problem is really a researchable one. And then out of the research gap, I can now proceed to articulating the research goal. So now I know the problem, now that I have a clear problem to address in my proposed research, or I have a clear research gap, I can now again articulate the research goal. And it reads, this proposed research aims to determine the knowledge and attitude of sugarcane farmers in Negros Island toward climate change. The just a side discussion in this. I want to dwell a bit on this. Uh, I discussed in, in during the introductory parts of this course, during the early part of the semester, that uh, some students or even teachers, research uh, teachers, um, research professors thought that if they had the research goal, they already have a research problem. Sometimes uh, research students simply would like want to do or conduct a research on something and they thought that's already the problem. And please take notes that the research goal is just an articulation of the research problem. Okay, so it should not be the other way around. Uh, come up, that is, come up with a goal. I want to do this and then argue that this is a problem. No, that shouldn't be the case. It should be, you formulate a problem first, you identify a problem first, and then say, given that problem, given this serious situation, I want to, and then formulate your research goal. I want to determine the knowledge and attitude of sugarcane farmers in Negros Island so that at the end of the day, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to, to know whether or not they know the policy or maybe they were just forced to do it. And out of that knowledge, out of the information, the data that I would gather, I will develop a recommendation aimed at addressing the problem, okay? So problem first, and then research goal. And then, and then after the research goal, you need to develop as well your thesis statement. When we say the thesis statements, this is your, the thesis statements broadly construed, the thesis statement is actually the general idea of your proposed research. But that general idea is sometimes expressed in the form of an argument. Okay, now, thesis is, when we say thesis, that does not necessarily refer to that hardbound, you know, copy of your research you put in the library that you submitted to graduate school. Um, that, 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 that book, is called a thesis because it contains the main thesis of that project. So when we say thesis, that's actually your main position or, or your main arguments or the reason why you want to conduct this research, okay? And so, for example, you may say, my thesis is that the world is round. In other words, you're saying, my argument is that the world is round. And that is why Ptolemy is a pretty famous uh, Egyptian astronomer was wrong because look, following Galileo you know, and Copernicus, I believe that the world is round and that the center of the universe is the sun, not the earth, so and so forth. So that is your contention, that is your arguments, that is your thesis. Now, you need to develop your thesis in, in your research proposal, in your thesis proposal, because that's the main rational, that's the main reason why you want to do it. And that is why many professors during thesis defense will look for the thesis statements in your background of the study. Although I will, this, I will produce another video lecture on how to write the background of the study, I just want to preempt the discussion on that thing. So just very briefly, when you write your background of the study, we will be looking for this 
points. Because as I will argue later, the background, uh, the one page research gap, according to my style, or the research problem as a whole is the basis of your background of the study. And so when you write your introduction or background of the study or rational of the study, they are one and the same, you need to have this. That is why, again, I require my Education 502 students to come up with this at the end of the semester. And for my Education 505 students who are not under me in 502 last semester, you will come up with this one page research problem before you write your concept paper or thesis proposal or the background of the study of your thesis proposal. And so again, after the, after the research goal, you need to explain very briefly, you need to articulate very briefly your main contention, your main reason as to why you want to pursue this project. And so the thesis statements in this one page research problem, in this first sample reads, the researcher argues or the researcher claims or the researcher contends that if we know the knowledge and attitude of sugarcane farmers in Negros Island toward climate change, as well as local and international policies on climate change, such as RA9003 and RA8479, then she or he will be in the best position to offer some alternatives or solutions to the problem. So that's your main contention. That's your, that's your thesis. There is a problem that you have observed. And then you say, I want to determine, in this case, I want to determine the knowledge and attitude of these sugarcane farmers um, about climate change so that I will be in the best position or I can practically come up with some recommendations or solutions to the problem. So take notes. That is why the recommendation is the last part of your thesis because that follows your conclusion and the findings, of course. So after you have fully understood the problem by investigating it, by doing a survey or by interviewing these farmers or by interviewing your, your respondents and reading some literature, now you are informed by this data. And so therefore you can now develop a, a recommendation. And so you say, aha, since these farmers, for example, since these farmers know uh, uh, the policy, they are, they are knowledgeable about climate change issues, key concepts in climate change, but they are forced to burn the residual sugarcane leaves after harvest because they were forced to do so, because that's the instruction of the owner, of the boss. And so you do it. And so as a researcher, if that's your findings, after going there, doing some semi or ethnographic study or a case study after the investigation, then you can come up with some, for example, recommendation like, uh, since many, uh, uh, um, some of these uh, sugarcane planters or owners of sugarcane plantations are government officials, and so it is therefore recommended that the national governments will intervene and address the problem. So you see, you learn that you argue for, you argue for, you recommend that the national governments should intervene because the policy implementers, the local policy implementers were also at the same time the owners of the sugarcane plantations. But again, the point is you cannot do that. You cannot develop that recommendation if you do not go there and conduct research on the problem you have discovered. <clears throat> Let me continue. Also, through a deep understanding of the said farmer's knowledge and attitude toward climate change, the researcher will be able to develop and recommend actions and guidelines to bridge the gap between policy formulation and policy implementation. Okay? So there is, most of the time, there is a gap between these two, policy formulation and policy implementation. For example, in the, in the Philippines in general as a whole, we have 
thousands of laws, thousands of beautiful, nice policies and laws, but they were not properly implemented. Because sometimes, you know, this law will, like, like, like the card law, yeah? um, it, it has been there for, for, for quite some time already, but the government cannot fully implement that, the agrarian law, because they are the number one victims of that implementation, that policy implementation. So in this case, you know, uh, that research will contribute somehow, uh, not somehow, but contribute significantly in, in addressing um, um, not just the problem of air pollution and, and climate change in Negros Island, but also in terms of um, bridging the gap, closing the gap between policy formulation and policy implementation. So you see, before I go to the methodology, so you see, without research problem or gap, and then a research goal, and then thesis statements, the researcher knows exactly what to do next. This is what I meant that this problem, or this research problem, or your research problem, will set the sail of your research journey. You know the problem, you know your goal, and you know your main contention, you know your, the rationale behind the research, and so therefore you know exactly how to write the back of the study, what to look for in the literature review, what methodology to employ, and so on and so forth. Yeah? And then uh, the last part is the methodology. So since uh, I know already the problem and the goal and, and the rationale and the thesis statements, I can, as a researcher, anticipate the method that I will employ in this study. And so, for example, since I, since I want to know the knowledge and attitudes of the sugarcane farmers in Negros Island, a quantitative study will maybe it can be applied here, but but a but a quantitative study is not appropriate here. It's not the most appropriate appropriate method to employ. You want to know the the knowledge and attitude of these farmers. You want to go to the community and observe how these farmers behave, how these farmers you know uh, uh, do things in the community. And the data is quite personal. And so I do not, I need not apply a survey or, or, a, or a questionnaire in this case. I will be interviewing them. I will be talking to them. And so therefore, okay, the, the, this study is going to be a qualitative one. And under a qualitative research method, we have several research, we have several research designs, right? Under qualitative, we have historical research design, we have phenomenological research design, we have case study, we have ethnography or ethnographic research design, philosophical research design, a grounded theory, and whatnot. And so since it's going to be a qualitative research, you're going to choose what, what research design you're going to employ in the study. You may apply a phenomenological research design in this case, but since you will not be talking about the lived experiences of these, of these farmers, then maybe a phenomenological research design is not appropriate. And so you think, aha, a case study is going to be the research design in this proposed research. And so in terms of methodology, again, this is a qualitative research, and then we employ uh, case study design or research design, and then for the research instruments, the tool that you will use in gathering your data, you will employ interview on observation. Okay. So you see, um, um, I, I, I want to, to, to insert this, this one of the misconceptions, major misconceptions in research that every time we think of research, what automatically comes into our mind is statistics again. We always think of statistics. And then in, in, in your statement of the problem, you always have, you always have, you have this habit of including unnecessary questions, even if it's, you know, it does not you know, um, fit or it's not required in the study. Like, like, uh, in the statement of the problem, you always have the last question. Is there a significant relationship between the profile of the respondents and blah, 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 blah. So my point is, 
please get rid of the idea that research should always involve statistics. No, in this case, since this is a qualitative research, we don't need to have statistical treatment here, okay? And so you don't talk about correlation between variable A and B. In fact, in qualitative research, we don't have variables, which is a key concept. So when your professor says, you need to define your variable from the very beginning. He or she is referring to a quantitative research method. Here, we don't have variables. We employ a qualitative research method and a case study research design, and then interviews and observation as your research instruments. Another thing that I would like to emphasize at this point here is, look, because I have a problem in mind, I already have a researchable problem. I have a research goal and I have a rational thesis statement, then I can think, I cannot think of a method to employ in gathering the data. So the method will follow or your research method will follow or depend on your problem, on the nature of your problem. So if the problem is about the knowledge and attitude of sugarcane farmers in Negros Island, for example, in, again in this example, then you do not necessarily think of statistics. And so you have to think, aha, uh -huh, since the, the, the data that I'll, be, uh, that I'll gather is based on the experiences or based on, on the insights or personal opinion of the respondents, then interview would be the instrument and so therefore, a phenomenological research design or a, or, or a case study design is the most appropriate in this proposed study. Okay, so again, my point is do not start with a method because that's the problem with many. You always think of, uh -huh, uh, I need to have statistical treatments, I need to measure variables. Well, that's for quantitative research. And so, what if that method is not required? In your, in your research problem. So there's going to be a mismatch. So please start with the problem or research gap and think later of your methods, okay? And so since I have now the, 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 the research problem and then the research goal, I have the thesis statements, I have the methodology, I can now think of or I can now come up with a working title. We call that working, working title because at the end of the day, it will change, you know, depending on how uh, um, you conduct your research, the working title will, will, will change along the way. That is why, again, we call that working title because it will just serve as a guide. Later on, you will finalize the title, especially when you are done with your research, you know, um, at the end of the day. And so again, um, since I have not a problem, the research goal and the thesis statement and methodology, I cannot think of, I cannot formulate a working title. And in this case, I may think as a researcher, since I will be investigating or, uh, or determining the knowledge and attitudes of the sugarcane farmers. Um, and then um, one of the key concepts here is climate change and air pollution policy and things like that. So, uh -huh, maybe, uh, uh, the most appropriate working title in this case is Knowledge and Attitude Among Sugarcane Farmers in Negros Island Toward Climate Change. Now, before, we, before I proceed to the next sample, look, this is what I explained many times already during the, in the introductory part of our course. That, and please take note of this, that your working title is, the main, is actually the main problem of your research. You do not frame that title because it's beautiful, or you do not appropriate that kind of title because it's eye-catching and, and blah, blah. You have that working title because it captures the key concepts of your research. And so at the end of the day, the working title, the research problem and the research score are, are, are in line with each other. So that, look, in this case, since I will be investigating the knowledge and attitude of sugarcane farmers in Negros Island, and actually that's the main goal of the research. And the problem is that they continue to burn the leaves and blah, 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 blah. And so 
I say, knowledge and attitude of sugar cane farmers and because I have to change. So if you look at the three, working title and the research government problem, the research world, they're in line with each other. They're coherent. And so if you have this very strong research problem, and when you write and, and, in, and when you properly write your background of the study, then it's going to be a very beautiful, a very nice research paper or thesis. Okay. Let me proceed to the next sample. This one. Uh, sports as drug abuse prevention. As you can see, I want to go directly to the methodology parts. As you can see, we will be employing a quantitative research method here. Because the first one is more in the qualitative aspects. I will give you a sample, uh, which employ a sample of a research problem that will employ a quantitative research method. Okay. But anyway, I'll go back. Uh, uh, let me go back to um, uh, the research gap or problem. Again, I will talk about the work, working title later. So let me read the, the research gap or the research problem. The Philippine government has been very aggressive in solving uh, drug addiction in the country for more than two decades already. In fact, a huge chunk of the country's annual budget goes to health and drug addiction. By the way, please take notes that my, my, the, the framing of the research gap here is, is um, sometimes not based on concrete facts. This is just an example. I'm just giving you a concrete example of a research problem. So what I I'm, I'm, I'm what I, I I wrote here may not be supported by by concrete facts at the end of the day. So when I say 14% rate of 14%, it may not be 14% in reality. I'm just using a figure, a sample of a figure, you know, that will drive my points. Okay, so this is just a sample. Please take note of that. Again, the Philippine government has been very aggressive in solving drug addiction in the country for more than two decades already. In fact, a huge chunk of the country's annual budget goes to health and drug addiction. However, according to records, the number of drug addiction cases in the Philippines has been steadily increasing for the past five years, with an annual average rate of 14%. This problem will have serious consequences on the Philippine society, which include increasing crime rates, rise of hospitalization cases, ch and child neglect. This problem will also deplete public funds. So you see, upon looking at this a few sentences, you, will, you can conclude right away that this is indeed a serious problem a serious issue that needs to be addressed, that needs mature consideration, that needs urgent consideration. Hmm? Drug addiction is one of the, drug addiction is one of the social issues, one of the major social issues in the Philippines. And then, and then a huge chunk of the country's budget goes to that. And then we are, the country is poor. And then there is a possibility that it will contribute, that budget, that issue will uh, contribute in the depletion of public funds. So you see, as a researcher, for example, before I proceed to the goal, as a researcher, you may want to contribute in addressing the problem. And if you propose this research in, in your master's or PhD thesis, then, you know, um, your panel or your advisor will appreciate it. Yeah. Let me proceed to the research goal. Upon seeing the problem, by just observe again, by just observing what's going on around, I can develop a research goal. As I and and, and as I as, as I mentioned already, um, I, I, I did not go to the library to come up with this problem. I just observed because we are researchers and please take note in research. One of the major sources of data in research is observation. 
That is why in, in, in anthropology, ethnography is one of the most beautiful sources of data. It's one of the most reliable sources of research data because look, the anthropologist wants or go to, um, to the community and, and really observe what's going on around. And if, and if the anthropologist has, has observed, you know, um, uh, a particular practice like uh, the medical and healing practices of the indigenous people in Surigao, the Manobo in Surigao. So that data is, you know, based on concrete observation. And in this case, for example, you don't need, you know, to close the margin of error, in, like in, 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 in quantitative research. You don't need, you, you cannot be wrong because you have observed it. Yeah, that is why I am emphasizing this other source of research problem or research gap. You observe, come up with a research problem. And so the research goal of this proposed research, the goal of this proposed research reads, as a way of responding to this problem, this proposed research aims to determine the relationship between sports program and drug addiction cases in the city of Tacloban, for example. In doing so, the researcher will conduct correlational research in selected barangays in Tacloban City with high number of drug addiction cases. The researcher will introduce sports program in these barangays and then measure its relationship with the number of drug cases after quite some time, maybe six months or one year. Okay? So that's the goal of the research. Before I go to the thesis statement, allow me to explain this a bit. Look, you argue, you believe as a MAPI teacher, for example, that sports can be a tool, a means to prevent drug addiction. So with that statement, you can anticipate the title. Aha, uh -huh, I can have the title sports as drug abuse prevention. Yeah. And so since, since, since you believe that uh, sports can be a tool or can be a means to, to reduce or, to, or if, not, if not prevent drug addiction, then you want to um, introduce sports program, in this case, a city of, in, in the city of Tacloban. And you may, and you may identify barangays with, with high number of drug addiction cases. Let's say, for example, uh, one barangay, uh, let's say in one barangay, in a particular barangay, 90% of the youth are into drug addiction, are into drugs, into drug abuse. And there's a serious problem. And so that since you as a researcher would like to contribute and address the problem, then you introduce sports program in this baranganis. So for example, you have, you have identified 10 of, uh, barangays in the city of Tacloban with high number of drug addiction cases. And then at the start of your research, you record the number of cases. And then you introduce sports program because you have a huge budget, for example, you introduce a sports program, including uh, um, psychologists and, and things like that. And then you, 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 because we have in every barangay, we have the basketball courts, you added, for example, uh, uh, a badminton court or a tennis court, a table. Um, you, because you get a funding again, you have a huge funds from UNESCO, for example, or UN, um, you introduce, you build a sports center with, let's say, board games like chess and things like that. And you have a sustain, sustainable sports program. So you have this intervention, this sports program as a whole, as a package. And then you introduce that to the barangay. And then after six months, for example, or one year, you, after six months or one year, you record the number of cases and determine whether there's a decrease 
in the number of drug addiction cases. Or maybe there's an increase, I don't know. But the point here is, look, you want to determine whether there is a significant relationship between a sports program on the one hand and the number of drug addiction cases on the other hand. Yeah. And so again, I did not, I need not go to the library and come up with a problem. I just observe what's going on around, especially in Tacloban, and come up with a research problem. And so thesis statements, the research is convinced that if more youth are engaged in sports program, then number of then the number of drug cases in the, in the Philippines will decrease. That is your, when you develop your thesis proposal later on, that can be your, the, this can be the basis of your hypothesis. And so in this case, you may make a hypothesis, although hypothesis, uh, we employ hypothesis mostly in experimental research, but we can also have you know, this in, in correlation research. And so hence, the researcher assumes that there is a significant relationship between the introduction of sports program in selected barangays in, uh, in selected barangays in Tacloban City and the number of drug cases. So look, I have the problem, the research problem. I have the research goal, and I have the main reason, the rational. That is why rational in the study, the rational why I would like to conduct this research. And so therefore I can now think of what method to employ. And before he articulates the research method here, I mentioned that already. Suppose I'm just thinking of what method to employ. Since I know exactly what I need to do. And in this case, I am going to measure the relationship between, between two variables, sports program, number of cases, and blah, 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 blah. I'm going to measure their relationship. And so therefore, reason tells you, if you have mastered the basics in, in, in research, that you will not employ a qualitative research here. Because in qualitative, we don't talk about the relationship between and among variables. In qualitative research, we don't measure variables. And so since in this proposed research, you're going to measure the relationship between variables, then we have narrowed down you know, the method to employ here. I may not employ mixed method here. So it's very clear from the very beginning upon knowing the problem, the research problem that I want to address in the, uh, I want to see addressed in this research, that I will be employing quantitative research methods, okay? So it's going to be quantitative research because I'm going to measure variables. Next question is, what type of research design will, will I employ? First is, going back to the four major types of research design and their research design and their, and their quantitative research method. We have descriptive research design, we have correlational research design, we have experimental research design and quasi-experimental research design. So, when you so, so if, you, if you think about your problem, no, I'm not going to make an experiment here. Although I can make an experiment on the drug addicts in that barangay, but that is not my intention. I would just like to determine whether this sports program has a significant relationship with the number of cases, the number of drug addiction cases. I, as a researcher, I just want to know if there is really a relationship between them. So that look, at the end of the day, if at the end of the research, the number of cases uh, uh, drops, then I will recommend and argue that the Philippine government, not just the government of Cloban, will introduce sports, more uh, a sustainable sports program in all barangays to curb, to help curb drug addiction. And so I'm not experimenting. I would just like to determine the relationship between these variables. And so therefore, I'm not going to do experimental research. And so I will not employ experimental research design. 
I'm going to measure. And so therefore, I'm not going to employ, employ a descriptive research method. Aha, the most appropriate research design here is correlational research design. So you see, what I'm trying to show you, as I already showed before a while ago, is that your methodology depends entirely on the nature of your research problem. So don't think of a method from the very beginning and then come up with a problem. I discussed that also in the orientation part. So the first lecture that we have, uh, demystifying major misconceptions in research. Most of us have these, these attitudes, you know, researchers, I'm referring to researchers, that you know, when, when, when developing a research proposal, we begin with our biases, with our orientation, you know? What I mean is we always identify with a particular tradition, like I am a quantitative researcher because I am a statistician. And so therefore I will just do this. Others would say I'm a qualitative researcher because I, <laughs> I'm coming from the humanities and, 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 and the social science and the humanities. And so I, I do ethnography and, 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 and archival research and philosophical research design and things like that. Well, there's no problem with that. Just don't impose your standard on others. What I mean is, what I mean is, as a researcher, we need to master the basics of both methods, quantity and quantity. So that even if you are a quantitative researcher, you align yourself with, with a quantitative research method, even if you are a statistician, you can do qualitative research as well, especially if that's what the problem requires. And so as a statistician, for example, as, or as a mathematician, and then the problem you have encountered in your community is mathematical anxiety among your students. You cannot measure anxiety quantitatively. Sometimes, if most of the time, if you talk about, if you talk about mathematical anxiety, then you need to interview the students. Then you need to observe them. Then you need to employ another or other method, a method other than quantitative that, that will measure. So that you will know, you know, how the students feel, how they have been faring. And so maybe a phenomenological research design can be employed in that case. So you see, even if it's, it's, it's a discipline, that, even if the discipline is mathematics, you can still employ qualitative research there because Again, my point is that's what the problem requires, mathematical anxiety. And so therefore you get to interview these people through, or you get to talk to this to, to your respondents, to the students. You don't measure, <laughs> you don't, you don't give them a questionnaire, you know, and, and do some survey. You can do that, of course. But the most appropriate thing um, to employ in the case is interview them, talk to them, get some data that are not quantifiable. So going back to this example, look, I'm going to measure the relationship between sports program and, and, uh, and drug number of uh, and, and drug cases, no, yeah, number of um, drug addiction cases. And so therefore I, I will employ a correlational research design. Just to reiterate for those who are not present during the, 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 the first lecture of the, the introductory part that under that, when you say quantitative research method, we're, we're talking about methods. But under quantitative methods or research method, we have several research designs. And that's, again, as I mentioned already, uh, descriptive research design, correlational research design, experimental research design, and, 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 and quasi-experimental research design. So these are the four major designs, research designs under quantitative methods. On the other hand, in qualitative methods, um, again, the qualitative is the method per se, but under it, we have philosophical research design, historical research design, we have case study design, we have narrative case design or narrative design, we have grounded theory, we have ethnography, uh, archival research and things like that. And in thinking of a method that you will employ in your research, please do not mix this thing up. 
you will be in deep trouble, especially when you defend your research, you know, especially in the conduct of your entire research, okay? And so since I have now the research gap, the research or the research gap or problem, and then the research goal, the thesis statements, methodology, I can now come up with a working title. And maybe at this point, I can say, uh -huh, since I want to um, determine the relationship between sports program and drug addiction cases, and, and, and um, my, one of my intentions in this research is to, to um, help address the, the problem of drug addiction in the Philippines. And, and one of my arguments and one of my contentions here is that sports can be a means, an effective means or tools to uh, curb, if not prevent drug addiction, then the working title can be sports as drug abuse prevention. So you see, I, I, I do not come up with a working title that is eye-catching or a title that is you know, beautiful based on aesthetic. Maybe if, if that happens, that should be a, 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 an additional um, uh, points or, yeah. But in, in, in scholarly writing, especially in research, you don't think of a beautiful working title like in, in, like in, like in literary writing or in, like in news writing where in, when you have to, to, to come up with a very eye-catching working title or title, even if the title does not really capture the key concepts or the important points in the article. I've encountered that many times already. I read, I click an article on, on the internet, on Facebook because of a beautiful, uh, title, but when I read the contents, no, it does not match the working title or the title per se. Well, leave them alone. If if that's the practice in in in, in literary writing and journalism, then 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 be it. That's the discipline. But in in scholarly writing, in 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 research, most of the time our working titles are boring. You know, it's not based on aesthetic. It's not eye catching because as researchers, you have to think that the working title really capture or captures the key concepts, viables in your proposed research. See? And then it proceeds to the third sample. The working title is um, for the third sample is factors affecting the SBM level of practice in the division of Belira. Okay, uh, this is this this one is not my uh, own um, research problem. This is based. This is actually the the research problem or the the uh, one of the. Um, um, uh, this thesis proposal is actually uh, owned by uh, my, my thesis, one of my thesis advisors. So this is not mine, it's hers. So I just use it here because this is one of, uh, uh, one of the nines, uh, um, research problems there. So um, the working title again is the working title again is Factors Affecting the SBM Level of Practice in the, in the Division of Pidira. For that, let's go directly to the research gap or problem. It says, based on records, the researcher found out that 19 out of 22 high schools in the division of Biliran practicing SBM have failed the assessments and validation for SBM level three advanced. My advice he has added several sentences, nice sentences after this, but I cut them because I believe um, the first sentence is enough to show that there is indeed a valid, a serious problem here that needs to be addressed. I want to reiterate this point. I want to not reiterate, um, I want to do some uh, side discussions on this in terms of the, the use of phrases and words here. First is please take note that in research, in my style, all the words that I use in the I used in, in, in my paper has a specific purpose. 
I do not just use that for the sake of, you know, pala, uh, palamuti, or I use that as, you know, to make <laughs> the statement flowery. That is not my intention. Second is, look, as you have observed in the last two examples, there is the words, the researcher observes, or in this example, there is the phrase based on records. Again, these phrases are loaded phrases. We as researchers intentionally use that because we are sending a signal to our readers. We are sending a signal to the panel members of a thesis, the tradition defense, that what I have at the moment is not a product, it's not just a product of my opinion. What I say at the moment is based on concrete facts. And so that when I said, a core, the, the, the researcher observes, yeah. let me go back so as you can see. When I said the researcher observes that sugarcane farmers in Negros Island, okay. When I said that, I am sending a signal to my readers that the source of my data is legit, is valid, because I went there. I observe. I do not make up this data. It is, again, based on hard facts. And some of that, in this example, when I say, based on records, it's a simple, it appears a simple phrase, but it's a loaded phrase because again, we are sending, my advice is sending a signal to her panel members, to the readers, that the idea here, the data here is not based on opinion. That even if she is still writing a thesis proposal, she had, already conducted an initial research in this study based on records. When, when the researcher said based on records, that means she went to the library maybe, she went to the field, she went to a particular office and asked for this record, okay? So when he said, when she said the researcher found out that 19 out of 22 high schools in the division of Delira, <laughs> she's not making up the story. Man, there is a hard facts. Okay, so, uh, and so that, uh, of course, I will share this later when we write, when, 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 I when I make the video lecture on how to write the background of the study, I will share some techniques there, some important points to consider when writing your background of the study. Um, that's that's in relation to this that your data must be based on concrete facts okay? so the problem is 19 out of 22 high schools did not pass but as we can anticipate you know there's a long uh, discussion here in the research problem but the point here is according to the departments of education of course in the philippines there might be some, you know, students who will be watching this, this uh, video outside the Philippines. But according to the departments of education in the Philippines, a public school that practices school-based management or SBM must pass the assessments and validation course BM level three advanced. So they, they must be they must be at least level three advanced. Okay. But in the division of Biliran, province of Biliran in Lake in, 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 in Eastern Visayas, wherein we have 22 public high schools, 22 high schools there, 19 of them of these schools did not pass. And so as we will argue later in the background of the study, this is problematic because of course, reason tells you that 
this will this will definitely jeopardize the quality of instruction, the quality of management in that school because they are not compliant with the standard. So with that problem, we can have the research goal. And it said, this proposed research aims to determine the factors why schools in Biliran practicing school-based managements with lower levels failed to meet the standard of SBM level three advanced. In particular, this proposed research will look into the challenges and difficulties that school administrators and teachers encountered in complying with the standards. So you see, we have a clear goal, the main goal of the research, because we have a clear problem. And out of that, we can now develop the thesis statements. What would be your main reason why you would like to determine the factors that, you know, uh, um, um, cause uh, uh, schools in, in, in Beliran to, to fail in, in the assessments. And so you can have the arguments. It reads the researcher contends or the researcher argues or the researcher claims that if we will be able to determine the reasons or factors why this school keep on failing the assessments and validation for the SBM level three advanced, we then can offer alternatives to the problem they have encountered. And as you notice, the thesis statement is quite generic. In the, in the past three, two examples, it's always my arguments, the argument is that blah, 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 blah. The argument is we need to know, we need to determine because that will, that will, that would put the researcher in the best position to offer some alternatives to the problem. That would, that would uh, put the researcher in the best position to formulate recommendations that will contribute in, in, in resolving the problem, in addressing the problem. And then, and then, um, uh, in this case, we can apply uh, quantitative research methods here, uh, depending on the, the intention of the researcher. But in this case, uh, the researcher employs qualitative research, particularly case study design. So uh, she will conduct, the researcher will conduct interviews and observation and maybe some, you know, um, some facts and figures that will help um, establish the, the position, the, the arguments of the research. And lastly, last example, Okay. The working title of this last example is uh, Policy Challenges and Responses in the Time of Pandemic, the case of Banco Central Nang Philippines. Okay. So what's the problem here? Or the research problem or research gap? Let me read. As is well known, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented instability and high volatility in global capital markets. In fact, economists and financial analysts, analysts alike have initially assessed the areas of, of the overall banking sector that have been impacted by the pandemic, which include, but not limited to, profitability and credit management, operational resilience and business continuity management, and banking securitization landscape. This situation has resulted in banking institutions around the world resorting to even unconventional policies to address the problem, or at least cushion the impact of the pandemic. Given that the global banking institutions are still in the middle of combating the pandemic, there is therefore a need to explore the policy challenges that banking institutions faced during the pandemic and the way in which policymakers and implementers address the problem. So you see, it's very clear. The problem is very self-explanatory. 
because of the pandemic, all banking institutions, including the World Bank, including the Bank of Central and Philippines, face this challenge. You know, there should be some policy challenges and responses, issues about how banks or banking institutions, financial institutions, have to respond to the challenge we're in. Look, there is, as we mentioned, uh, um, um, loss of profit, and then there's less contact with customers and things like that. And so with that problem, we can now develop the, we can now articulate the goal of the research, the main goal of the research. And so it reads, this proposed policy paper aims to determine the policy challenges that the Banco Central and Filipinas faced during the pandemic and the way in which its key policy makers and implementers address the problem. In particular, it asks the following questions. What are the policy challenges that the BSP, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, or Central Bank of the Philippines, faced during the pandemic? Number two, what mechanism or tools does the BSP develop and employ to address the problem or at least cushion the impact of the pandemic on its overall business operations? And three, what are the best practices of the BSP that other banking institutions may learn from. Yeah. I, the researcher was able to develop, or articulate a very nice, clear research goal because the, the, the research gap again and again and again is very clear as well. And so what would be the main reason why you want, or the researcher would want to determine the policy challenges of the World Bank? And so the argument is the researcher argues that an exploration on the challenges that the Banco Central and Filipinas faced during the pandemic and the way in which its key policy makers and implementers address the problem will enable the researcher to develop policy recommendations for the BSP. This will in turn enable the BSP to continue rethinking its approach to solving the problem and identify what works best and what not. See? we have a very strong rational reason as to why there is a need to conduct this research. And for the methodology, the researcher will employ um, qualitative research design, will employ qualitative research method with case study design, with case study as the research design. Okay? And then the instruments to be employed here is in gathering the data, are interviews, observations, and archival research. Please take notes the three, of the three. Research method, research design, research instruments. So when we say method, that's the overall method that the researcher will employ. And after that method, you have the designs. So again, in, in qualitative research design, you have case study, research design as one of its designs, of course. And then after the design, when you think of when you talk about gathering data or the data of your research then you talk about research instruments in quantitative research we normally use means or we normally use um surveys questionnaire yeah in gathering data of your research and in qualitative research we normally use interviews observations archival research could also be as instrument so um, that's all there is to it for now on problem formulation. And in my next video lecture, I will talk about the second uh, way in, in developing, uh, in, in formulating a research problem or in, in spotting the gap of your proposed research. And in that uh, video lecture, I will uh, talk about, again, the second way is doing a literature review. I think that's all for now and thank you very much. I will soon um, I will soon keep in touch with you for the instructions for the next performance task performance task, which is I will be asking you to develop your own one page research problem and then we will approve that in our next synchronous session. So,
that's all for now. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best. I hope you learned something <laughs> from, from this lecture. Bye for now.